For those at home, I'm Matthew Schutte with Holo, and I am here with Nora Bateson. Hey, Nora. Hey, Matthew. Good to be here. Good to see you. Uh, where are you at present? I'm um, in my apartment in Stockholm with my um, grumpy tree stumps in the back. Why uh, are they grumpy? I don't know, but I just think they're so great. They look like these two grumpy old guys having a conversation. So <laughs> it's kind of a, a beautiful thing. Um, so yeah, I'm in Stockholm, Sweden. And I am in the Austrian Alps. Um, I'm at a little thing called 33 Monkeys, which is basically this retreat for some speakers and other folks uh, that participated in this uh, conference this week called Year of the X. Each year they have a slightly different uh, topic and, or they, they're, they're based on the, the Chinese calendar. So this year was Year of the Dog. Um, and uh, so I was there speaking about how to design digital currencies that go beyond money and pay mm. attention to signals and enable communities to steer in richer ways. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm only sort of getting to participate in this kind of amazing retreat with these incredible humans that are here because I've also got to do a whole bunch of, <laughs> of work this weekend uh, related to Holo. Uh, but it's nonetheless, it's just gorgeous here. Totally gorgeous. Matthew, I know you're supposed to be interviewing me, but I suddenly have this question that I have to ask you. Yes. Okay. This is a conversation, you know, so. Yeah. Okay. So... I was in a Facebook discussion recently um, mm -hmm. with several people that I know we both are in communication with, and I was being my radical self. Um, and I said something along the lines of, uh, I don't think that it's possible to have any kind of material asset profit without exploitation, mm. okay? Um, and this is something that I've been really puzzling on for quite a while. Um, and it's, n it's a very uncomfortable subject because the, the deepest assumption of our socio-cultural economic structures um, include the idea of material asset profit. Okay, not necessarily money. It could be land. It could be, you know, any kind of cryptocurrency. It could be, it's just that idea of material asset profit. Mm -hmm. That in order to achieve that, it requires that there be differentials, buy low, sell high, and that that will always be the outcome of some kind of exploitation. Mm. Okay. So are you so, putting me on the spot? Is that what you're doing? Are you trying to get me to say bad things about capitalism? No, no. Actually, that's <laughs> not where I'm going with this at all. That, as far as I'm concerned, that's a given. Um, <laughs> but my question is this, okay, because somebody in the – in the conversation raised the question, well, isn't profit, you know, isn't that just the same thing as a squirrel that hides lots of nuts before winter or a bear that, that, that gets fat before, um, you know, going into hibernation or, you know, aren't there models in nature of something that would be akin to material profit? Okay. What do you think? That's, that's where I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, I think it, in an ecosystem, different actors have different abilities to do particular transformations right? The grass has a capability to transform carbon dioxide and water into glucose using sunlight. And a cow doesn't have that same internal capacity, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so the grass takes in these inputs, this information that's in the form, right? All information is always in a particular form. And it transforms that information. I'm actually watching a bee right now pollinate those little, these little flowers. Oh, it's so perfect. Sorry. <laughs> so it, th this bee right now is, is running around doing pollen stuff, and it's about to go transform uh, that pollen into honey. That's one of the transformations that it does, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the other transformations that it's doing is it's, it's transporting pollen from one flower to another and as a consequence helping the regenerative process for those flowers right it's helping basically them uh, mate <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so anyway uh, a, 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 a sort of related aside but nonetheless an aside so grass is able to take information in a particular form carbon dioxide water light and transform those reeses into a different form glucose oxygen right um and but does nature accrue material asset is there any example well as that, that grass, as that grass does that mm -hmm. it it the outputs of that process are an accrual you have this building up of oxygen in the atmosphere you have this building up of grass plant matter right Mm -hmm. that, that is now those resources stored in a different form. Okay. They've been transformed. And when a cow comes along, if you don't have the grass there, the cow is not able to survive. If you do have the grass there, the cow, and, and the cow can't survive because it's not able to take carbon dioxide and light and water and turn that into the food that it needs to, to persist, right? right. But it, it sees grass and it goes, oh my gosh, and it can eat the grass, right? And when it eats the grass, it has a four chambered stomach and it's able to convert that grass into milk and beef and bone and blood. And it breathes in oxygen and it breathes out CO2. And okay. stop. But it's also doing useful work for the grass. Okay, so the thing is this, is that now we have to add time. Yes. All right, if we freeze frame everything that you just said, yeah. Nature turns into a machine. Yeah, but it's not a machine. But it's not a machine. That's it's right. not a machine because of time. Yeah. Okay, time passes and those characteristics, those processes that you describe, whether it takes, I don't know how, you know, a season or 10,000 seasons or a million seasons, that those all of those particular relationships which i would actually call conversations okay yep. between different okay. organisms between different processes yeah. that those are changing and responding and recalibrating all the time yes. so okay one example that i like to use just to bring it home is to say okay you, you know you have your hand is structured virtually the same way that your ancestors 10,000 years ago um, had their hands. Yeah. What you use your hands for and what they use their hands for, not the same. True. Okay, so the structure is not really um, right, right? <laughs> the structure doesn't really dictate the purpose. Yeah. It doesn't really dictate the limits of the relationship in this larger ecological forever shifting conversation. So well, when you have this idea about the grass, yeah. one of the things that happens in that is that there are these, these, um, these ebbs and flows, these periods of you know abundance there was a lot of rain and the soil came after a fire so there was a lot of grass and that made it possible for there to be a lot of deer on the hillside and then the deer bred a lot because they could and then they ate all the grass and the next year there's no grass and so the deer begin to die yeah yeah okay so the material asset is functioning um, it's, I, I can't call it that because it actually doesn't, first of all, it doesn't position status. 
Okay, so much of what material asset is, is actually about an idea of status. It's actually about a kind of leveraging of status. And please note that I'm not using the word power. Um, so uh, in that sense, even if there is more grass, even if the deer do reproduce, even if that does happen, the, the extra, because I, I don't want to mix up extra with profit. Extra and asset are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it gets absorbed into a longer conversation, but it does not ever produce leverage. Um, in the sense of one organism or, you know, some deer being more powerful than other deer and ruling the deer. Yeah, I think that gets it backwards. But at the same time, if the deer are not doing patterns that end up making life easier for the grass in some way, mm -hmm. then the grass goes away and then the deer go away. And the pattern that you talked about with, hey, there was tons of grass and so all of a sudden there's tons of deer and then they eat up all the grass and so then life gets harder and we lose some deer. I describe that process as bloom and bust. Yeah, overshoot. Right? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and bloom of bus is used, useful still because the bloom period gives uh, the deer a greater diversity, right? It's, yeah. it's generative, so now you've got diversity. And the bust period ends up making it so that what we, ha we had a bunch of options on the table, and then depending on what the conditions are at that moment, some of those forms, some of those deer make it through. Right? right. And maybe, maybe it's because they had a genetic mutation that allowed them to eat some slightly different things or survive in slightly colder temperatures or whatever it is that the conditions are at that moment. Right. Uh, we have no idea. But this generation and curation pattern is, is how nature learns. And um, as you are so keenly aware, uh, wealth, the, like the wealth is in the interrelationships between these systems. Mm -hmm. And the thing that feels so dire at the moment for me is that we are squandering the real wealth. We've got this token system of dollars in a bank account that we're, how we think about wealth. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what the actual systems are that all of our little human back and forth things are riding on top of are these patterns of interrelationship in ecosystems that took a really long period of time with tons of trial and error and dancing together at not just the deer and grass layer, but the deer and grass and the microbes and the oxygen, you know, chemist, chemical makeup of the, like there's this fractal learning that nature does across all scales simultaneously that's very different from the scientific method that, that over Iter generation after generation after generation of these dances being done and there being some new thing that then all of a sudden has reverberations and has consequences in the larger ecosystem and then things the, the, the dances shift and there's new learnings and then there, there's new niches and this thing's a little bit away from these things and it starts to change in different ways and, and we get greater diversity. All of that took a really long time for nature to find dances that were reinforcing and it's only the patterns that regenerate that we end up seeing persist and they can't just regenerate at one of those scales they have to regenerate across scales and, and that doesn't mean that they're constant it means that you end up seeing a similar shape and it's able to manage to show back up or something similar shows back up but it's well it's a this, learn is, this is what i call somathesy right this is basically somathesy this is this idea that um actually any living system is a context of mutual learning and that that mutual learning is um it's a criteria of life actually it's a criteria of being able to of the different organisms being able to respond in different ways the different cells responding in different ways um, and that's a you know it's a, it, you can learn to respond in ways that aren't necessarily productive they can be destructive and, and, you know, right now, as we're looking at some of what's happening in Europe, um, people are learning to, um, to break and to, to have very isolationist 
and nationalistic feelings toward people that actually they've been living with for decades. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's interesting because those are not new relationships. There's nothing new there. Uh, and yet there's suddenly a, a sense that this is an invasion. Um, so the conversation is changing. People are responding in new ways. And like you said, that mm. the undertone of the responsiveness that we're seeing right now is an undertone that scares me, not because of the particular actions or the particular immigration policies or the particular financial policies, but because the, um, the meta messaging inside of those conversations is one that does not put the interrelationships first. Yeah. It does not nurture the interrelationships between people, between cultures and with nature. And like you said, these have taken a long time. These are connections that have taken generations to build. And even the slightest, you know, sort of two years of toxic vitriol is going to take decades to undo. Um, so how do we, how do we begin to explain to you know my Swedish stepchildren why there's so much violence between their classmates now I mean we didn't I, I don't think my husband didn't grow up in a family in schools where there was that kind of violence yeah. and it's just growing roots. So the way, it's not like we're ever not tending to those relationships. It's the way that they get tended to is always a message about how the system is learning, how the somathesy is becoming. And is that somathesy one in which it, there is a lot of regenerative possibility yeah. Or and creative possibility, or is it becoming violent and destructive? And maybe one leads to the other. Maybe it gets violent and destructive, and then there's a recognition, a learning, that that violence and destructiveness wasn't in the benefit. Um, and the, and the thing that you said earlier about time comes in here, right? Right. So these learnings happen, but but how? how painful is the lesson um it, it varies and it's and what's the trauma that's exactly right like we, hey we might try that pattern and if that pattern ends up undermining relationships undermining effect then there's gonna be major pain felt mm -hmm. and eventually we'll go oh wow that pattern sucks but it takes a, a significant period of time to learn that through that direct method. The way I frame this is, you know, if you start doing something that doesn't fit the context, mm -hmm. you've got two options. One, you either stop doing that thing, mm -hmm. and shift your behavior to start to fit the context, or you die, <laughs> right? And so by your loss, at the loss at this higher level, it wasn't just your behavior changed, you went, you exited stage left altogether, oh, that behavior left. But one way or another, that behavior is not going to continue. It, it, and and, and if, if you're not just talking about an individual here, you're talking about a whole society. That's a possibility. We could have all of you humanity could, it go. It could be a whole species. That's right. Humanity is not, is not forever guaranteed to have a, have a place on this, this stage. And Certainly so, not with fancy living rooms and new cars. Yeah. And so, and so the hey, if we don't figure out new patterns that actually fit uh, our patterns that don't fit, they're going to go away. Either because we chose not to continue running them or, or because we didn't and we went away. Right? And well, that's just and how this, it works. This is just how it works. And I'm with you 100%. And, 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 um, obvious, and, and I'm biased. I would prefer that it not be the latter. <laughs> yeah, I, I would too. And... Um, 
I, I don't know though. I don't know. In order to get there from here, there's some big shiftings that have to take place. Big well, let's start, talking, let's, let's start talking about Holochain then. What is okay. it that you, what do you like about what we're up to? You know, self-serving interests here, right? Um, obviously we're going to share this and et cetera, et cetera. But what is it? So we've talked about some really dark, dark stuff, which mm -hmm. unfortunately is a lot of what drives many of us on the Holochain project and in the metacurrency project to work on what we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not unrelated, right? That we're, we're not, we're not here because we think computers are cool. We're here because we're like, Oh, there's an existential threat and humanity, humanity really needs to up its game. So what, what is it? I, why? Yeah. Why, okay. What do you think? Well, I, I want to preface and, by and, saying, and, and then give me, and then give us some pushback on like what the concern, what, where you think we're, you know, what, what might not this be capable of or where are the doubts? Okay. But we'll start with the good stuff. <laughs> um, well, first of all, differentiating holo from holo chain is always a, you know, we got to do that right up front. So when we're talking about holo chain, we're not talking about your cryptocurrency. We're talking about the pattern that you're working with. Okay. So holo chain is interesting to me because I spend my living waking days doing everything I possibly can, um, sometimes more successfully than others, to help everyone that I am working with to be able to have a greater level of perception of the interdependency of the world that we're living in. Um, as far as I can see, that's maybe the most important thing we can do right now, because this habit of being destructive to vital interrelationships that produce the, the processes that are not only the conditions of life, but, you know, life affirming for not only, you know, our relationship with the ecology, but relationship between cultures, relationship within families, communities. Um, our own body, what is health, right? These are all questions that require that we really understand and have a much uh, more developed process of perception um, and description of the contextual interdependent processes. And right now, what, what is the, the norm is to silo these off, to split them apart, and we think of health as something that has to do with doctors or exercise or smoothies. But we're not dealing with health as something that has to do with education or the way that children, um, you know, feel about their culture or their, their, their parents. Uh, we're not talking about health in terms of how it is related to religion, how it's related to um, economics, how it's political. All right, so this level of interdependency in this, even the idea of health is, is a portal into the complexity of even our own identities. Who, where is the edge of the self? When I'm talking about my health, where is that edge? Is it at the edge of my skin? Is it about my own organs and my own you know, pulse rates? Or does it extend beyond that? It's because I feel that maybe I'm not ever really healthy if I'm worried about my family or there's, you know, deep scars of wounding, um, you know, from mental health to emotional health to physical health. It's a very fine line of, you know, why, why would I overeat? Why would I become addicted to various drugs? Why would I be engaged in any kind of self-harm or not really want to be in relationship with other people? So where is the edge of my health? Does it go to, to the edge of my family? But what about the health of my family? Where's the health of my family? Is that in the, the actual people? Or does that, is that a reflection of the health of my community? And, and where's the health of my community? Is that just inside my community or does that extend into the biosphere and so on? So this piece of being able to take into consideration, to develop our processes of description, 
of, of conversation, of thinking about how we can even um, respond in new ways, okay? Because right now, when you ask someone to respond to health issues, they immediately think about the doctor's office or their running routine. They're not thinking about the way that the public transportation serves their community. They're not thinking about the way that the pollution that is a product of all of the industrial um, work. They're not thinking about our relationship to technology in this way and how sedentary we're becoming. They're not, there's a, all of these different contextual processes. And, and there's this excuse that says, well, this is all just too complex. There's too many contextual issues and it just makes my head explode. And what I really want is to have a nice, simple one, two, three, four, five step of how to be healthier. Look at the magazines and the grocery stores and pretty much that's what they're all offering. Look at the workshops in most of the, you know, centers for this, that, and the other. And pretty much that's what they're offering. Okay, this appetite for this kind of one, two, three, fix it is actually, I think it's a disease at this point. It's some kind of viral insanity that is a huge distraction from, from the work of developing our ability to actually respond to the relationships that are right in front of our face. Um, so I am hopeful that Holochain is part of the process of helping to illustrate those relationships so that we have to take into consideration with greater care, not just greater frequency, not just greater intellectual capacity, not just greater technological capacity, but ultimately with greater care, what these interdependencies um, can provide. What is this conversation? And how can we create better conditions for a better conversation of life? So that's my hope for Holochain. Now, my... Um, can I ask a question? Can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah. Um, that... The way you, you, you framed that, it sounds like, oh my God, what a burden this is going to be, right? I have to do so much more work. I mean, you, 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 I think you're totally right in that that's what we need. But man, that doesn't sound appetizing. Right? The thing is, you know what? We do it all the time. We just don't recognize that we do it. Nature's doing it all the time. You want a model of what this looks like? Look out your window. Look at your hand. Look at your face in the mirror. You want a model of what it looks like? Don't draw me an engineering schematic. Look at your garden. Look at a jungle. Look at a bird. It's everywhere. The model is everywhere. So, exactly. Look at where Matthew my, is right now. I'm having it's my heels most, are alive. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the most, it's the difference between simplicity and reductionism, okay? Yeah. Simplicity yeah, is actually there, always. Simplicity is, is grace, um, and it's always complex. The compl think of like, you know, Japanese flower arrangements or an apple that grows on a tree. It's the simplest thing in the world and the complexity then the many relationships and the millions of years that it took right. to bring that apple to be is that's right is i mean it's it's something sacred it's and something my, sacred and and but reductionism is something different Reductionism is when you try to pull things out of their relationships and you look mm -hmm. at that apple as though it had nothing to do with the tree and the tree had nothing to do with the soil and the soil had nothing to do with the microbacteria and the microbacteria had nothing to do with the minerals or the way that the rivers have flowed or the interaction with the human, you know, chemicals or not. Um, so, and so, so would you say that the hope with Holochain is 
that it enables that kind of pattern of interrelationship to be held more easily or, or exercised more easily? Is that, or how would you frame, how would you frame that? Because that's how I perceive it. Okay, right? well, I first of all, I think you have to be really careful about talking about patterns. Okay, because the way that people hear patterns, having been in the business of talking about patterns for a while, um, we have to always add some words when we talk about patterns. Um, one is possibly that they're changing patterns. One is possibly that they're fluid patterns or that they're responsive patterns. Anything we can do to add movement and perpetual change to the idea of pattern, we always have to do because otherwise people start to, to generate these static um, patterns in their heads and that's not useful. And then they copy it and paste it in a different context and it's totally destructive. <laughs> yeah. it's, all, it's a huge mess, uh, particularly since there is the problem of what our existing epistemology is able to perceive as a pattern. Okay, so when we were talking earlier about the grass and I was saying, watch out, watch out, watch out with this because the pattern that you were describing is there, but it, it's there through the lens that sees mechanistic patterns. And we can turn nature into a machine. And if we go looking for that pattern, we will find it. You can make those arguments, but you can only make them from within the epistemological habit of looking for those types of patterns. So they're so tricky because we don't know what patterns we're not seeing. The, 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 for me, the meta pattern that I'm, I try to make visible there is, is that you actually need difference at mm. some level. And I don't mean we need to be separate. What I mean is um, you need the interrelationship, that you need relation. And you don't want... Um, This is what I, this I is, you, of course. Can you, yeah, can you tell me, talk, tell the story that you mentioned to me about how your work got taken and, and, and mal, malformed, I guess I'd be way to frame it. Oh, I hate that. I mean, it, you know, here's the thing is that I, I know that I, I have a different kind of freedom, okay? I'm not answering to any organization that is trying to make money. Um, by selling something in the world. I am not part of an academic institution that's trying to um, reiterate its identity, okay? The position that I'm coming from is this uh, long time, I, you, you know, 125 years or so of Bateson thinking and a lot of other people's thinking as well. And um, I, I have permission to be pretty radical Can in you, ways that most, other people don't. Most folks at home are not gonna know what, what you mean when you say Bateson thinking, except okay. for that's your name. Can you give your heritage and why, why what, 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 just do the, do the kudos thing so that other people can see it, because right now it's invisible to anybody watching this. What's, what's the history there? Why 125 years? Well, you know, we could be here all day, Matthew. So we have to figure let's, out let's some it. limits to this. Who was um, Grandpa? Who was Dad? Who is Nora? Okay, so, by the way, so, before you know, we dive if, into that, if I were to, I'm stealing your stories. I'm giving you credit, uh, but I'm stealing your stories. The Norifying thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm very much borrowing that, giving credit where I where, where I can. Uh, but I'm I am borrowing heavily from the Bateson heritage in my own attempts to articulate some of these patterns. So, okay, so with well, that. the pattern that you were just talking about is the pattern of difference, okay? It's the difference that makes a difference. And this is something that my father coined as a phrase, and it has everything to do with what we actually think about as information. So my dad was um, Gregory Bateson, and he is, 
depends on who you ask because the anthropologist will say he's an anthropologist and the psychotherapist will say he was a family therapist and the and the um, ecologist will say he was an ecologist and the information theorist will say he was an information theory person and so on and so forth so his work touched a lot of different fields and um people would like to say that he was an interdisciplinary scholar and i think that he would probably curdle like lemon and milk if you said that to him um, because he was not he absolutely was not an interdisciplinary thinker what he was doing is he was looking at life and life is not interdisciplinary okay there are no disciplines in the hills behind you there's hills there's life. What he was doing was using the language and the, the lenses of different disciplines to create a multiple description of life through our existing processes of, 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 of describing. Okay, those happen to be disciplines, but we should never make the mistake that life is interdisciplinary because life is alive. That's another thing altogether. So he did a lot of different work. Um, his books are really hard to read. There's, they are some of the most beautiful material that I've ever seen out there. Um, and that's an honor for me to say, because um, he was my dad. And the reason that I think it's some of the most beautiful work that's out there is because he never uh, sums it up. He never gets to that point where he says, and so life is da 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 da. He never does that. Um, and in fact, at the core of his work, there is a kind of care. Okay, we talked about care earlier. A, a kind of care to never um, box it in, to be very, very careful of finite definitions because life is changing, things are moving, patterns are shifting. So it's, it's a kind of care that allows for things to be actually alive. Um, so he was a huge intellectual force and uh, a, often he is mostly credited with his intellectual contributions, none of which would have been possible without uh, the tenderness of his being. As his daughter, I was definitely um, engaged with both of those. And, um, and so was he, absolutely. You know, our breakfasts were as intellectual as they were tender. He didn't go out of character um, to, to make eggs or to take me camping. That, that, that scholar and that person was always there. What I learned from him is that this thing that we're talking about, about how we see the world and how we generate an understanding and this description of these interdependencies that form life, that that thing, it is science. It is sacred. It is social. It's cultural. It's linguistic. It's, it's, also, it's just, just a way of life. So this is something that I think, you know, about Holo that I'd like to bring back in is that for so long, this material has been relegated to a particular set of mostly academic people or professional people using it in very specific ways. And the real gift is to be able to, to have it on board. Gregory used to say, it doesn't count until you have it in your elbows. And so, you know, you can talk about systems all day long. You can use all kinds of jargon and draw all sorts of models. But if it's not in your elbows, if it's not in the way you respond to your child, if it's not in the way that you walk through a forest and you see the interaction between the organisms, if it's not in the way that you think about your own health, you haven't learned a damn thing. So before him was my grandfather. And William Bateson is famous for having coined the term genetics. That's his word. Uh, and William 
William, I just have to say, if I could sum it all up, I would just say, but William was right. And um, I say that because William goes went down in history as that, that geneticist, that biologist who got it wrong, but he didn't get it wrong. He got it right. And what he was saying all along was that the evolution of an organism is in not only in the organism, it's in its relationship to its environment. So if you look for the evolution in the organism, you're only going to get a little small part of the information because so much of the way that organism has learned to respond to its environment is the way that the, the organism is shaping itself. Um, and that that changes. Environments change, and so organisms have to respond in new ways, or they don't, and they die. So where's the change? Okay, everyone wants to talk about change, 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 change. We gotta have systems change, we gotta have economics change, we gotta have political change, we gotta change, change, change everything. Where's the change? So because of the way we're trained to see the world and think about causation, that idea of change is getting placed in the parts. So we have to change the institution of education. We have to change our political system. We have to change our economic system. We have to change all of the pieces. But William was right. It's not there. There's no change to be found there. The change is in the relationship between them. Okay, what I would call in this era, the liminal space, the space between, okay? The, the education system does not exist as an isolated island. It exists absolutely in response to culture, to our ideas of employment, to our economics, to our political, to our, right? To the relationship between the generations, expectations, relationship with nature, right? We had, we had many generations of people who didn't have to consider their relationship with the ecological world in their education. And therefore, we got an industrial system that did not consider the relationship with the biosphere. Now we have a generation of kids that absolutely have to consider their relationship with the biosphere. And so the kind of, the kind of inventions that they're going to think of are going to be completely different if we give them the conditions for learning in a new way. But where does that come from? Where is that change? Is it cultural? Is it political? Is it economic? Is it inside the school system? Is it a curriculum? Where is it? So it's in that interdependent relational process. Um, so William was a hero. He was pretty, pretty cool. He fought for women to be um, able to attend Cambridge and not only as students, but also as professors. And he fought eugenics, um, which was the sort of the nasty bit of science that uh, justified a lot of the um, experiments on, you know, making judgments between what, which humans were more worthy than others and how to generate a more perfect human being that were part of the, um, the Nazi history. And he fought that from as early as the turn of the century, saying this is dangerous. This is really, really dangerous. What you're talking about is a violation of nature, a violation of the very thing you were just talking about, Matthew, about the differences and responses to differences being critical to evolution. And, um, you know, if you get an idea of what the perfect human looks and smells and walks and talks like, and you start to create that, that's a huge interruption of the millions of interactions that you can't see. And so, okay, that's the big piece in, in all this 125 years of work is that this, there are countless interactions and relational processes that we will never see, we will never know about. And to carry on, like we can just do a five-step program in a linear way, 
and offer a goal, a deliverable, have a strategic way through it because it's profitable, okay? Okay, and so you sign the check here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so well, that's, couple, that's the history there. There that you had pointed out to me, which is, it's not just that he opposed the eugenics stuff, but that that eugenics stuff was uh, an aberration building on top of his work. Yeah. Right. And it really pissed him off. And, and I get it. You know, I, I went to his archives at Cambridge and I found this letter that he wrote to the king of England in, in 19, I think it was 1917, where the King of England uh, wanted to offer William knighthood. And he wrote him back and said, I'm sorry, I can't accept that. WB. He didn't even sign his whole name. His faith in the institutions that exist at any level was totally gone by 1917. He had seen the way that science was was co-opted by the academy and by the way that the academy was co-opted by politics and politics was co-opted by economics and that the economics then went into the journalism and the way that culture was being manufactured out of this contaminated relationship between the institution and he was horrified he was absolutely horrified and so therefore his the consequence was he had zero faith in any institution whatsoever. He left Cambridge, he left the Royal Society, he didn't want anything to do with the king. He completely, um, I don't know, I like to say he was a punk rocker, but when I lose my strength, when I start to feel like, yeah, but we have to change the system from within, then I can remember William and I can remember, nah. Fuck that. It's never going to work. The institutions are never going to change themselves. They never have. They never will. The change is in between them. It's in the relationship we have with them. So, you know, it's a lonely place. It's a hard place to stand because everyone's always like, yes, but you know, you have to speak in ways that people will understand. And what people understand is the language of how you make profit. And they want to know, but how will this benefit me? How will I take this work with me to work with me on Monday? And how will it make my organization more profitable? How will it make me a better person at what I do in my bubble? And those are all the wrong questions. Every single one of those is the wrong question. It's so funny. I, um, so we, we got to hang out a couple months ago in Stockholm. I, it was one of the highlights of my little, you know, 34 city, 99 day European tour. Uh, God. <laughs> so fun. And uh, I was just after that, I was heading to London to go to an event that Manet Gupta was holding that he'd invited me to. And I got to spend some time with him. And we knew that that was coming. And uh, I, I really enjoy interacting with Vinay because I, uh, I disagree with him almost entirely on almost everything. Um, and, uh, uh, but I have fun in that disagreement. Like it makes things visible that might not otherwise, not otherwise be visible. But, you know, if uh, in an immodest way, you know, if this were a film and this is the Star Wars films or whatever, and I'm Luke Skywalker, right? So if I'm Luke Skywalker, he is most definitely Darth Vader or the Emperor, you know? And you were sort of just before going there, I felt like, oh, I've got Obi-Wan here trying to pull me towards the light. <laughs> right? And it was so, you know, so stark, the contrast and so visceral, the me, me going, hey, but my role right now is to try to make some really complicated things visible enough that somebody can go, oh, let me just, let me just touch it. Let me just try it. Me, in, instead of going, ah, no, that's not for me. Right. And so I'm, and I'm not getting a lot of time. You know, I get 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. And so I've been trying to find how can I communicate this in a way where people actually do want to dance again on Monday. They want mm -hmm. to try this and they want to talk with others about it again you know next month right. and um uh 
and and you basically went warning warning <laughs> warning uh and and told me about the ways in which your grandfather's work had been taken and abused and the ways in which your work had been mm-hmm. taken and abused because you hadn't been i don't know what i don't know what the because is there but the, the, in this talking about difference uh, certain groups do you want to tell that story at all or do you not have time for that um well i mean it's just that we uh everybody's looking for the new it thing. Okay. They want to be the new lean. They want to be the new agile. They want to be the new, they want to have the new Bitcoin. They want to have the new it thing. And so if you provide ideas that are, are creative new ideas, they, um, they get metabolized into the existing system. The way that that looks is it, it, It looks like uh, a lot of competition Um, and it looks like a kind of colonial attitude. Honestly, it feels like there is a kind of general permission to just take. I'm just going to take that. And if I do something that you couldn't do with it, well, that's just because I was able to and you weren't. And one of the things that happens is that I am very, very careful in case you hadn't noticed um, not to offer solutions. I am. I fully believe that if you go looking for solutions right now, you're going to corrupt the existing complexity and never be able to see the emergent processes that are taking place. So I'm so sad about my fellow systems thinkers that are out there singing for their supper, paying their bills by selling systemic solutions. God help you all. It's a, you know, it's the biggest sellout. And, and so I feel like if I don't hold that possibility of not doing it, if I'm not there to say, don't, you know, I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to, I'm not going to break. I will not solutionize my work. I will not make it into instrumentalism. I will not offer a five-step program. And I can only do that because I have my family to lean back into. And also I have these ghosts to answer to. Let's be real. If I, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I've got this, this William and this Gregory in the background that, I mean, they paid the dues and they, neither one of them were ever really understood because of it. And so, you know, part of it is a kind of vindication of saying, you know, they were right. And if you want to honor life, you don't tell it where to go. Can I, can I make my pitch? Make your on pitch. Why, why, why I like Holochain in that regard? Yeah. Not that it's the right thing, and not that it's the only thing, it's a thing. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things that happens often when, when I step into specific communities, especially non-technical communities, communities that are really focused on people who are trying to change the world in some significant ways, they go, oh, shit, this guy thinks that tech is going to solve everything. Right. And, and, and actually, our whole approach is just the opposite. We don't trust that we can prescribe what the right form is for any particular dance. There's no possibility of us being able to, to, to prescribe all of the, the, I don't know, every context is so very different that there's no way that we could possibly get that right, right? right? And so we're not trying to do that. We're trying to create a pattern of communication mm-hmm. that people can make use of and start using. And if it proves useful, they can keep doing that. And where they find it doesn't work so well, they can change. And they don't have to change it in some bureaucratic way where the entire community goes, yes, we took a vote and now we're updating. That the individual can go, I don't like how that language is working. I'm going to try to start using some new words or some new grammars. I'm going to pay attention to some different signals. And they can do that with the other members of that group or they can start paying attention to some different signals from a totally different space and begin mm-hmm. combining those in ways that work for them. 
And it's only through that iterative process of them trying things and seeing what's working in their context that mm -hmm. the learning occurs. And, and so we're trying to, to solve something. Sorry for the bell, bells in the background. There's a church. It's kind of nice. I like it. <laughs> so, so, so appropriate to this moment. Um, but it is, uh, we think it's the only way that we can actually get somewhere useful is by not that us creating a platform, because if we created a platform, then suddenly, ha, huh, we're the solution, but us creating a pattern that others can make use of and can change and, and a pattern can enable two or more agents to dance together with a particular grammar, to mm -hmm. be able to send signals yeah. from actually i think the word grammar is more useful than pattern yeah and, and, and grammar meaning we're sending information in a particular form that we have some mutual alignment around mm -hmm. right i'm sending a fluctuation in a way that you have an internal capacity to receive so right now sound waves are you know i'm bumping some air molecules there's some computers in between but and then the sound wave hits your eardrum and you are transformed. And because you had that ability to be transformed, you could perceive of sound. And not just that you, it, it, you got transformed in some way, but you were transformed in a meaningful way that you were able to convert that into a signal that, that was useful to you or that was in some level of alignment with me. And that that emerges over time. There was, there was a whole lot of iterations before that dance really formed, but that, that ability to do that dance gave us a resonance or a harmony that gave us uh, a collaborative advantage that got favored for that kind of dance to be able to continue. But once we have that dance, you can do additional grammars on top of that. So we could do English, we could do Chinese. And I don't have Chinese as an internal grammar that I have the receptive capacity for. So even though I can hear the sounds, I can't yet make meaningful use of those sounds when they're using the grammar of Chinese. Now, if I kept interacting with those folks for a year or two years, pretty soon I might, be, I might start to gain some ability to communicate in ways that were in alignment with them. Is it perfectly aligned? No. But it gets good enough through this experience of failure <laughs> and success and going, oh, that word means cup, right? And eventually I figure out, oh, no, actually, it's not actually cup. It means mug <laughs> or something. And, and through this iterative dancing, I'm able to come into greater and greater alignment in that particular dance. But, but it's not a download from above. It's a, a, a mutually held thing that has some level of alignment. And we think, we think that that's the pattern of learning at all scales. And it's how, it's how lang language is held, it's how culture is held, but it's not how, yet how we do digital communication. And it's not yet how we do collaboration at scale. And our and, hope is that and, if yeah, and I think that the reasons for that are really needing to be tended to. Um, and so one of the things, like we've just been through this, the breaking of the news about all of our, you know, Facebook profiles being adopted by Cambridge Analytica and all this hubbub, which of course isn't news at all, and it should never have come as a surprise to anyone. Oh, <laughs> and. Because you know what? Facebook is not an altruistic project. Period. Okay, this brings us right back to where we started from. What, what, they, have, what they have is, is a beautiful pro potential for being a place where human beings can make contact with each other and connect and communicate. But the second that became a profit-making endeavor, it became exploitative. So the thing is, is that this is about remembering the wealth that altruism is. That the reason to do something is because it offers a possibility for connection and relationship to learn and develop, and that those connections and relationships are in, are in the natural process of we as human beings are creative, improvisational, relational collections of selves, including all these organisms that live within us. Add profit to that, and it's destructive. And I know there's people who are going to want to argue with that. 
but I just feel like it's a good idea to say it out loud and take the risk and say, okay, okay, bring it. Um, because, because it's, you know, it, it didn't work. There's, I don't think there's any way, like I said in the beginning of our talk, we're going to have to seriously think about what we mean by profit. And if profit is material assets, it means that the actual relational process inside what's getting created is premised on leveraging that exploitation. And that's too bad because it's really nice to buy new things and to have that sense of status and to, to be where we are. But the structures that we live within that require that profit are the very structures that we have to have the cojones to change. And I think that the interesting thing here is that that pattern uh, with, let's say, Facebook or the internet in general, the World Wide Web as it's currently structured, was about creating places where people could commune. Sort of. Making, yeah. Uh, virtual places, right? Digital places. Um, but by making it about digital places, it immediately it makes it top down and enclosable. It makes it so that not only is Facebook controlling the, the data, but they're controlling the grammar. Mm -hmm. that we Absolutely. That the way that we can, what it's possible to say, when it's possible to say it, how you can say it, that's the grammar. And if we want to try using different grammars, hey, I want to try something slightly different. We only get supported in that if it works for their business model and only if it works for their business model more generally. And right. And, and the argument is, is that that's what's reasonable and rational and logical in our cultural world. Why would anybody do something that they couldn't make any money off of? I mean, even our friends in impact investing are in this modality. Yeah. yeah. And at so it's, a, you know, w at what point do we have to say the cost of shifting the, our epistemological, our perception of getting out of this system. The cost of getting out of this system is not recoupable in any material way. It is only recoupable in terms of our relationship with each other and the environment and the possibility for our survival. <laughs> you are not a saleswoman. I, I have. I, I think I just <laughs> made a great case for the fact that no one can make any money off the, rev the, the, the evolution, okay? There I think, is no I think, profit think it, in the evolution. You made it not att attractive at all for anybody who sees the world from their current lens, right? So they, they, they're going to flee that. Um, whereas I think there are totally examples of what we're talking about and what we're trying to enable here that we use all the time, right? Okay. So nobody paid me to learn English. I learned English because it became, I was doing that dance with other people and it was useful to learn English. And on and it, the flip side, no one's making money off you speaking English. That's right. Right. And, and when I write something down, I don't have to go pay my writing teacher. And they don't get to see my writing. It's not like they, you know, it's not like, oh, he had learned well, how to write so for the rest I of his mean, life. We're going to be able to surveil what he does and charge him for it. If you're really unhealthy, okay, and it's December 31st, one of the things that people do is they go out and they spend a whole bunch of money on a gym membership because they want to get healthier. Mm -hmm. All right. They want to change their system and their patterns to a different set of patterns that will produce life affirming, life extending um, possibilities. That's all I'm talking about. We're going to have to pay to change the patterns. And you don't get your money back. Nope, you don't get rich by being in better health. It doesn't actually do anything for your financial status except cost you money every month at the gym. So, well, I think the gym so, is a terrible way to get healthy, but uh, well, as, as I you do too, but, but I'm just saying that that's <laughs> something people are familiar with. They're familiar yeah, with yeah. this idea. Well, but I also, well, I actually do, I'm going to disagree with you on this. Okay. And yay for just because it's fun. Right. I, think that, I think that actually the way that we we end up doing the things that are useful is is that we get tricked into it because our longer term self-interest 
ends up being aligned with our shorter term one, our bodies get us high to push by pushing the boundaries of our skill set. And it's not because for any reason other than that was really useful because mm. bodies that get us high, but when we push the boundaries of our skill set, they end up pushing the boundaries of their skill set a whole lot because it's fun. Yeah, but Matthew, you, you are speaking as an athlete. You're already inside that relationship. If you've been a couch potato for a while, you're not there at all. There is nothing appealing about going to the gym. Except, no, that's right. The gym right? is the wrong that's, architecture. The gym is not the way. Because we have a technical word in the business for this, and it's called play. <laughs> play, play is just learning. It's our natural way of doing learning that's, a, that, that's internally driven, not externally forced upon us. Play is where we are going. And if there's any hope for me for what a whole chain is, it's play. That you guys, I, I'm pretty sure you don't exactly know what you're doing. And I'm hoping you don't because um, the play is where we find it. And, it <laughs> and, and on that note, Matthew, I have to go. I'm so sorry. Thank yeah. you, Nora. It's always so good. It's always so good.